Hello, everyone. This is uh, JJ Risha with uh, Pismo Ventures, and I have with me today Dr. Fred Haney. I will let, uh, let Dr. Haney introduce himself uh, in a couple of minutes. But before we get started, I just want to tell you a little bit about our program today. So um, this is would be about an hour. We will have a really open discussion uh, about what it takes to be in the top 1% fundable startup. And Dr. Haney has a lot of experience in this field, and we're going to learn from his wisdom today. We encourage you to submit your questions throughout the entire program as we're moving through. So don't wait till the end to submit the questions so we're able to answer them. Um, also, if uh, for some reason we cannot get to your question, uh, we will uh, be happy to answer it. So you can always send an email to me. Uh, at pvinfo at Pismo Ventures, and uh, I will forward any email uh, that is addressing Dr. Haney to him. Um, uh, just a little bit about uh, Pismo Ventures. Uh, we have been doing these live streams for a few months now, and the, po the point of this is to really help entrepreneurs, startups, and the ecosystem understand what it takes to really navigate this vibrant community that we have and the investors uh, and, and learn what investors are looking for. And so some of the uh, uh, presenters or interviewees that we have are really serial entrepreneurs, VCs, movers, shakers, angel investors, uh, people that really could help you navigate uh, this environment. So we're, we're happy to bring everyone on and, and really help, help everyone really learn what it takes to build and grow uh, a, a startup from, from scratch. Um, or if you are currently in a startup mode, we'll hopefully we'll be able to shed some light on what it takes really to uh, to be a successful startup. Uh, before uh, my, I have Dr. Hader introduce himself, I'm going to just uh, quickly tell you a little bit about Pismo Ventures. Uh, we are a, a combination of a venture firm and a venture accelerator and a studio. Uh, and we also have a uh, software development arm so what, what does that really mean? We, we, are, uh, we help businesses to build the right business around the, the, the solution they're trying to solve in the marketplace. Uh, we also um, uh, invest in, in, uh, in our startup companies, resources and cash. We help them develop software if that's what they want, although we're agnostic. We facilitate funding um, to help them really succeed. Same thing, we open doors as well. And um, also, we are building a fund this year. Hopefully, we'll be able to uh, potentially uh, invest in our startup companies, and our portfolio companies. We are a hybrid cash and uh, equity model, uh, which means that uh, we, we help you. We're willing to take some equity. We engage on a month-to-month -month basis, and we become a true business partner and uh, an investor in, in our portfolio companies. Dr. Haney, thank you for being here this morning. Um, tell us a little bit about you. Uh, good morning, JJ. Thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to our chat. Um, over the last uh, 50 years plus in my uh, business career, I've worked with hundreds of startup companies in uh, different capacities. Uh, it started uh, for me actually working with small companies within large companies. I was uh, heading up strategic planning for the Xerox Corporation here on the West Coast for a number of years. Uh, and uh, I, I was not for the copier business, but it was everything else. It was workstations, Ethernet, uh, word processing and things like that. Uh, those were all small businesses and we actually ran almost like an internal venture capital fund uh, inside Xerox. Well, one of my projects involved the Alto and Star workstations. Uh, I tried to get Xerox to keep that technology, which later became the Apple Macintosh. Um, I did a similar thing for uh, four years at TRW. I was heading up some strategic planning groups, uh, but I actually ended up in a couple operating uh, assignments. I sold two divisions of TRW. Uh, and I ran one division for about a year and a half, turned around and got it profitable uh, before selling it. Um, and then I got recruited uh, by 3i Group, 
Three Eye Group is the largest venture capital company in the world. It's a consortium of British banks. Uh, and they recruited me in the early 80s to set up and run a venture capital fund called Three Eye Ventures, uh, which turned out to be the largest uh, high tech venture capital fund in Southern California uh, for a while. Uh, we ended up investing $80 million in 65 different companies. And uh, we, we uh, uh, ended up with an excellent portfolio. We had, tw we had 20 IPOs, 20 acquisitions, and 20 dead companies. Um, uh, then uh, after 3i stopped making uh, investments in the U.S. in the early 90s, uh, I uh, was one of the 10 co-founders of Tech Coast Angels, and I was active in Tech Coast Angels uh, for seven or eight years. I was on the original Board of Governors. Uh, and then after that, I got more involved in working directly with startups. I've been a co-founder of uh, half a dozen startups, including DRC Computer, which became the most powerful gene sequencing computer. Uh, and uh, Novadime Therapeutics, which is the first uh, fungal vaccine for uh, candidiasis and also for uh, staph infections. Uh, so I uh, continue to work with startup companies. Uh, I run a group called Monday Club, which uh, has two companies come in and present to three different audiences each month. Uh, purpose is to help them improve their pitch decks and improve their chances of getting funded. Uh, and uh, two years ago, I tried to pull all that experience together in a book called uh, The Fundable Startup, how, uh, how disruptive companies attract capital. So uh, my thing is kind of what, what do you have to do to uh, get capital into your startup company? Okay, so it seems like you haven't done much in your life. And, and so I'm bored. <laughs> not very much. And uh, did you say 20 IPOs? Yes. Oh my God, that's uh, that's mind-boggling for that well, period of time, at least. So. That was a big number at that time for a couple reasons. Uh, we had to muddle through a period of four years from a, a Black Monday, 1987, October 19th, yeah. 1987. Um, the stock market tanked uh, and the IPO market shut down, and it didn't really reopen until uh, late '91, early '92. Uh, and uh, that's really why 3i ended up uh, eventually deciding not to make any more investments in the U.S. Um, but uh, so it was remarkable when we finally did get through that four-year period of time. In 1992, we had seven IPOs, which tied us with Sequoia Capital for <laughs> the largest number uh, at that time. And by the time we were all done, I, I'm not sure when the last one was, probably... Uh, 96, 97, something like that. It was over about a five-year period of time. We ended up with 20 IPOs. And the the internal rate of return on that portfolio uh, was about 25%, which was way above the averages for that time period. Yep. So just to let everybody know, this is not a backdrop behind you. It's not. It's he's sitting outside, and he's got a bird feeder, and there's a bunch of birds there. Uh, uh, flying behind you, so uh, I'm uh, I'm at my home in Lake Arrowhead, and uh, I'm 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 dressed uh, up a little more than I might like to be because it's kind of a cool day. But uh, um, uh, temperatures like 55 today, but the next couple of days it'll be at the high 70s or 80. You never quite know this time of year. And yeah, I'm uh, my uh, the deck on my home is like a treehouse where. Uh, uh, we, we get lots of birds, and if you come out and sit here at night at 9.30, you can even see the flying squirrel come in and uh, uh, grab food off the bird feeder. No, that's pretty good. <laughs> um, so let's let's talk. I mean, your book is about a fundable startup. So And, and VCs invest in fewer than 1% of startups. Are they are they relevant? That's that's a really it's a good question. I had a friend uh, not too long ago say the VCs do 0.0625 percent of the deals. So who cares? You know they're not really relevant. Well, yeah, I understand that they they invest in a fairly small percent. I mean, just 
you know, without trying to be too precise about it, think about it in terms of one percent of the deals they see, something like that. I mean, they they say that they do about one in a hundred, uh, if you ask them. So yeah, they do a small percentage of the deals. But if you look what's coming out the other end of the system, uh, the VCs uh, have investments in about a third of the companies that go public. So what does that tell you? I mean, <laughs> I mean that yeah. says to me that uh, they're doing a pretty good job of cherry, cherry picking uh, the deals that are are uh, really worth doing. So I, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't want to overstate this, um, but you could almost make the case that the one percent they do are the ones that are fundable. So. <laughs> It's interesting you say that. So what what is uh, what is fundable? What why don't the other ninety nine percent get funded? Good, good question. Um, well, I, I think the the VCs have a long list of due diligence items they're looking at, but to me it boils down to kind of two big picture kind of items. Um, First, they're looking for a really big idea that has some proprietary aspects to it. Um, Silicon Valley got started. I mean, that's kind of the home of venture capital. It got started around the notion of unfair competitive advantage. So the Silicon Valley VC firms were investing in uh, chip companies, uh, semiconductors, for example, that kind of stuff that had patented technology uh, that had long-term, sustainable, unfair, competitive advantage. Uh, big markets, big opportunity, uh, possibility of producing good returns. So that's part of it. You know, it's the idea that has to be a big idea, has to solve an important problem, has to be compelling, um, has to uh, be clear that there's going to be strong customer demand, all those kinds of things. The other half of the picture is uh, they're looking for management teams that they can have a lot of confidence in. They're looking for management teams, starting with the CEO and, and then working down, uh, that they think have a really good chance of building a successful company. Yeah. And uh, so, a venture capitalist is probably sitting there with 50 business plans on his desk. Uh, and, you know, some of them have really good ideas. You know, the, the kind of thing I'm describing, uh, big, big ideas, very compelling. Uh, and some of them have management teams that have succeeded in the past. I mean, they, they have track records. They can point to uh, past successes <laughs> or they have long resumes that, that show uh, that they've been successful uh, as executive managers. Uh, and uh, so you have to ask yourself, um, if I'm the VC sitting there looking at this stack of deals and I see one that has a really good idea and a proven management team, why w would I look any further? So I, I think that's, and you say why, which are the ones that do get invested? I, I think they're the ones that sort of satisfy those, those two criteria. And the other ones, you know, uh, if you try and break it down a little bit, um, probably some of the ones that don't get funded uh, can't prove that they are really addressing a, 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 an enormous problem. I, we use the word acorn to, today to describe these great big exit deals. I'm not sure I like that terminology. I mean, the VCs have always looked for... Uh, uh, in well, in old-fashioned uh, language, home runs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to me, there's a difference between a home run and a, a unicorn. I mean, I, and, and I, uh, yeah. you can hit a home run with a, a three hundred million dollar IPO. You know, it doesn't have to be uh, over a billion dollars. But I think the ones that don't get funded, surely some of them just don't have uh, a compelling enough idea. But also, some of them just don't uh, have management that gives the investors a lot of confidence in yeah. uh, in their ability to succeed. And, and one of the kind of tricky things about this equation, a lot of people 
don't particularly like to hear my message here. Uh, but the, the VCs probably won't tell a CEO, uh, look, you, you, you don't make the grade, you know, you, you don't, uh, you're not up to our, uh, our standards. What they're more likely to tell them is the company's a little too early or, you know, come back when you have some more customers. Uh, they don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. They don't want to uh, leave any bad uh, tracks behind. So uh, a lot of, there are probably a lot of companies that don't get funded for that reason, but they don't know it. You know, they, they don't necessarily know it. I, so, I guess maybe they're playing a little bit of politics. Maybe they'll leave that door open for the future. Exactly. And, and they may circle back around. I mean, they're, they're looking for good opportunities. So if the company comes back uh, in a different uh, set of clothes, uh, they might make the investment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're, we're already getting a lot of questions. So I'm going to start taking a little bit of questions from the from the audience um, so I hear I hear the phone is ringing off the hook. The, the phone is ringing too <laughs> so um, so this is from uh, this is from Ben Ben says I've been told that since I have a physical product and not a tech that investment is not likely is that so I, I'm I'm not sure I know. So it's a physical product, not a software, not something that's. Well, was the Apple was the Apple Macintosh a physical product? Uh, chips are uh, are are, are uh, certainly physical product. I, I, I there's m probably more of a distinction that we need to make, uh, Ben. Um, physical products certainly do get funded. Um, but I'll, I'll put two asterisks around that. One is that in today's world, uh, we're seeing a lot more movement toward apps and software and artificial intelligence and those kinds of things. So I do think there's some truth to that. Um, but uh, the other asterisk is that um, even when the VCs were doing a lot of uh, things like disk drives and, and uh, computers, and chips, uh, what they weren't doing was a lot of industrial products. Um, so if you had something that fell into that category, you know, that a manufacturing device or, uh, I don't know, maybe an x-ray machine or something like that, uh, it, it might have been hard to get uh, venture capital for that. Um, but the ultimate criteria, to, I don't think there are any funny any little rules that say, We'll do this, but not that. Uh, what at least the top level investors? They're just looking for an opportunity to make a good return on investment. So if they think they can do that with a physical product, I I don't think they have any uh, rules against it. Yeah, that's uh, I agree with that. Uh, we have uh, one from Mark. Mark says, "Hi, Fred and JJ. During raising the first round, what is the best to start a cold email pitch deck with?" Uh, the, the vision of the startup to grab attention or the niche, uh, the market that we start with our first product? Um, I, my answer would just be a resounding yes. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. You got it, Mark. So. <laughs> uh, well, uh, but, but you said the right couple of things. I mean, one mistake that a lot of uh, pitch decks make uh, is that uh, if, if I'm, I'm the audience, I'm sitting there listening, I get to slide six or seven, um, and I'm still asking myself, what is it exactly that these guys do? What do they do? So, so somehow, very early on, if it's not slide one, it should be slide two or slide three, make it crystal clear to me exactly what, what you do. Yeah. But then yeah. you said another important thing. I mean, that right, right on the heels of that, uh, or maybe even before. I mean, I, the sequence doesn't matter a whole lot. Um, you, you need to help me understand that you're solving an important problem. You know, so so the ideal pitch deck uh, starts out something like. Uh, there's this really horrible problem out there. It affects lots of people. There's no good solutions. You look around. Uh, the, there's no really uh, good way to solve this problem. 
Uh, and oh, by the way, we have exactly a solution to that problem. Here's what our solution is. Here's how it works. Here's why it's unique and special. And it's better than other solutions that, that are there. Well, that's, that's got to come. I mean, that, that's yeah. got to come later. Uh, and uh, since you brought it up, I'll comment. Uh, yeah. That's a weak link in uh, uh, an awful lot of presentations. Uh, I think people probably don't realize how much research uh, the top investors, the, at least the top venture capital funds, how much research they do on competitive analysis. Oh, yeah. um, a lot of people are, are familiar with the Michael Porter books. Um, his first book, I think, was, I'm, I may not get the title exactly right. It's basically competitive analysis, uh, but it's a how-to. You know, it's, it's how to look at an industry and divide it up and look at the vendors and look at the dynamics of competition with the industry. That's the kind of understanding that the venture capital investors want to have <laughs> of, of competition because competition is a very complicated subject. Yeah. And just because you're getting into the market with something different or better than what's out there today doesn't mean that you have a strategy for competing over the next 20 years and maintaining a competitive advantage. So, and what I see in almost all the pitch decks is, uh, well, here's a list of our competitors. That doesn't what is answer that the do? question that I'm asking, you know, or here's a little matrix that shows, well, we have these features and they have those. That doesn't answer my question either. Uh, you know, the, the question is much deeper than that. It, it's uh, convince me that you're going to be here 20 years from now. Uh, so really, it ends up being the sustainable competitive advantage and not just the solution. Sustainable and unfair. <laughs> <laughs> unfair, too. OK, all well, right. Un unfair means usually it means you've got some patents. You know, you, you've got there's something that's keeping competition out of your space. So some kind of a moat, I guess. Yeah. So. Yes. Moat's uh, a good one. Right. So we got we got a, a a question from Eric. If you feel confident in valuation and evaluation number, should you try to get funding via safe, or I guess some some kind of a convertible note, without evaluation or more conventional price round? I guess. Well, Eric, if so, if if you're comfortable or confident in valuation number, I assume you used to be a VC. <laughs> it's that easy. Um, I wouldn't be confident in a valuation number. I mean, I, you can, uh, the, I, I guess, let me be careful here. Because you, you certainly, there are things you can do to come up with a pretty good estimate uh, for the intrinsic value of a business. Even if you're having to deal with five-year projections and you're guessing at the value at the end of the five years, um, and uh, th there are things you can do uh, to come up with a reasonable uh, valuation number. Um, but that's not likely to be the number that you're going to end up doing with a VC. I mean, in, in the end, uh, your valuation is based on perceived value. And it's going to depend a lot on how many different investors are competing to get into your deal. Uh, and uh, I mean, here, here's a way to think about perceived value. When, when you uh, start out uh, to do your fundraising, I guess it depends a little on what you've accomplished up to that point in time. But, but before you've got the funding, your company's probably not worth anything. I mean, I understand about pre-money valuations and, and all that math, um, but the company doesn't have any real intrinsic value. You probably couldn't sell it to anybody. The, the company doesn't have any real economic value until an investor says, oh, okay, I'm going to put some money into it, and now you can do the math. You've got a pre-money valuation, and you put some money in, and you have a post-money valuation. Now you've got some value. So my point is just that the value of your company depends an awful lot on uh, people's perceptions and whether they're willing to put money into it or not. So I wouldn't get, I, I guess that's a long way to say, I wouldn't get too locked into a specific number. Um, 
I, I, I think you can either negotiate uh, with people, but but it's important to remember that VCs get paid a lot of money to figure out what companies are worth. <laughs> I mean, that's really the business they're in. So, that's, that's so the if, if you come on too strong about evaluation and say, well, we've done the math, we know what it's worth, uh, the VCs, you know, the little internal switch may click and say, well, I, the, this guy's not going to take advice from me. He thinks he's got all the answers. Um, so I, I would be careful about that. You know, you don't want to look like you're telling the VCs how to do their job. Uh, a safe is uh, not a bad mechanism. I mean, I, uh, the, uh, people have been doing convertible notes for a long time, and I've been kind of negative about that because the, the problem with the convertible note is, well, what happens if you don't raise that next round of capital? You know, most of these notes say, when you raise your series A uh, or series B, then it converts at a discount to that price. But what happens a lot of the time is the company doesn't raise that round. Right. Uh, and now uh, if the note converts to a, a demand note, uh, you just lost your company, you, you, know, you yep. lost your technology. So the yeah. safe kind of solves that problem. The, the, so I, I like the safe. The safe kind of avoids that problem. I guess it could solve it, but it also could not solve it too. This, it depends how the safe is written. Well, it, well, it just defers it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So we have a question from Terry, and Terry says, "How can I get into the Monday Club?" <laughs> <laughs> um, I, if if you uh, know a member, it, it's pretty simple. Uh, the the members send me pitch decks. So uh, send JJ your pitch deck, and uh, he'll forward it to me, and we'll take a look. There you go. I, 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 I just pick the best two uh, pitch decks every month. It's that simple. I, I go through a pile uh, and uh, pick pick the best two. All right. Um, so we have a question from Ankh. Ankh says, when is the right time for a startup to transition from seed stage to Series A, B, C with a venture capitalist? Uh, and and when is it time to go IPO? Um, That's a let me ask, question, Fred. Yeah. Um, let, let me ask answer backwards. <laughs> um, uh, every time is the time to go IPO uh, if the opportunity is there. The the uh, the, the problem with uh, planning for IPO is that uh, there are lots of periods of two, three, four years, sometimes even more, when the IPO market is essentially shut down. Uh, I mentioned the four-year period of time I had in the 80s. Uh, when the IPO market got slammed shut uh, after the dot-com bur bubble burst, it was seven or eight years uh, before it really came back. So it's hard to plan for IPO. You don't know if the opportunity is going to be there. So in a sense, I th the answer is, well, if there's really the opportunity, you should probably grab it. Um, as for the early part of your question, um, how much capital you raise and when you raise it um, is a matter of math. I mean, you, you really have to uh, put your business plan together, sharpen your pencil, uh, say, what are the things I need to accomplish here? Uh, what are the significant milestones? Uh, and those are usually things like um, getting an initial team, uh, building a prototype, building a product, getting a customer, getting a second customer, getting a happy customer, um, and, and uh, things like that. Uh, so you got to put a couple of those milestones on a, on a timeline and do some very careful uh, analysis uh, of how much capital you need uh, to get to each of those milestones. Um, you have to allow for the fact that it probably is gonna take you six to nine months every time you go out to try and raise capital and you wanna have some cushion in the bank. So you put together a financial plan uh, and the answer to your question is, is really probably pretty mathematical. I mean, it, you know, it's not it, it, there's it's not a strategic question uh, as much as it is a how much money do I need and when do I need it kind of question. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, th this leads me to maybe the next question, uh, Fred. Uh, so how 
you know, what about bootstrapping? How do you address, or maybe how should entrepreneurs address bootstrapping? Or should they just go always look for money? Um, good. Yeah, I think um, you can think about bootstrapping in different ways. I mean, I, I, I see a lot of articles about bootstrapping, and the theme is, uh, well, why raise money if you can bootstrap? You know, bootstrapping is an alternative. It's a way of building your company without uh, going out for money. I, I think about it in a different way. Um, I think about bootstrapping uh, as a path to capital. It's probably one of the best things you can do uh, to attract capital to your company. So uh, if you're able to use your stock uh, to build a, a, an implementation team, for example, and build a, a, a product, uh, an initial product, maybe it doesn't have all the bells and whistles, but at least it demonstrates your product idea and costs and those kinds of things. <laughs> and then you can take that out and get a few customers uh, and come, come back with, with satisfied customers Look, look what you've done from an investor's point of view. You've taken out almost all the risk. You know, when an investor looks at a raw startup, he sees a long list of risks. He, he, he's wondering, well, well will the, can the product be built? Can these guys build it? Can it be built for the cost, they say? Uh, does anybody care? Will anybody buy it? Will they buy it at that cost? Does the business model work? Can you make a profit if you sell this product at that price and build it for that cost? Yeah. Uh, is the market big enough? I mean, all those risks are sitting there on the table uh, for a venture capitalist, and they don't like to take all those risks. They don't like to take the risk of can the product be built or will the product work or will anybody buy it? So if you can bootstrap your way through some of those early risks and get to the point where the only real risk facing the venture capitalist is, um, can we scale this up to a national or international level? You know, we, we see it works. We see people buy it. People like it. Now let's just pour some fuel on the fire and, and, and really build this thing up. That really can help uh, improve your chances of getting funded. So I see bootstrapping as a, a fundraising strategy. The, the other uh, thing I'll tie back to our earlier discussion about uh, fundable management. Uh, if, if you don't have Bill Gates as your CEO or, or Steve Jobs, um, and you, you know, you, you're not necessarily right at the top of the list in terms of uh, proven successful management team, yeah. Well, one way to demonstrate that you know what you're doing and you can make things happen uh, is bootstrapping. You know, so so go out, you know, maybe you don't have uh, a, a lot of experience or past successes as a CEO. But if you can <laughs> find a way to bootstrap your company <coughs> until you have uh, some happy customers, um, You've, you've kind of demonstrated that you know what you're doing and you can make things happen. I recognize that not every company can bootstrap. Uh, some companies, uh, I, I see companies every once in a while, uh, especially uh, if, if they're building uh, capital equipment or something like that, um, they may need money uh, just right off the bat uh, in order to even get an initial design or a prototype or something like that. Uh, so uh, bootstrapping doesn't always work, but uh, in these days when we're dealing a lot with uh, software apps, uh, internet applications, I mean, one, of, one of the best examples in my experience is a company called LiveSafe, which has a, uh, an, a crime reporting app. Those guys uh, bootstrap that. Uh, as a couple brothers. They uh, had the idea. Uh, they used their stock to build a small team. They built the product. They got it out there. They got some PR. They got on national television a few times. Uh, they started networking with angels. Uh, and through that process, they found a CEO had, who had uh, run a successful uh, company in the past. And he became part of the team. And it, uh, uh, they've since raised, I don't know, 15 or 20 billion. And 
um, you know, they're, they're out there doing a good job. But that was a bootstrapping process that caused that to happen. So really, it's it's really about de-risking. The more you de-risk, you're going to look good to angels, to investors, to VCs, to anybody. Uh, so yeah, the bootstrapping is it becomes truly a strategy. And, and, and really, maybe, in my opinion, that should be always the case and not just a part of a strategy. Um, yep. Uh, so we have a question from Road Vision Technologies, and he said, uh, I have found there is nowhere to find funding for pre-revenue old economy, industrial startups, really to commercialize, no matter how great the business model, market side, and social impact. So he's not able to find funding or where's places to fund uh, a, a pre-revenue industrial type com companies. Yeah, and I, I go back to my earlier comment. Uh, at least the, the venture capitalists um, have never been <coughs> very active in what I would call industrial kinds of products. I, I guess you, know, you, you probably have to define that carefully and there are probably exceptions all over the place. Um, but it, it, here's an example of what happens. Um, I, I've, I've seen down through the years, I've seen a lot of proposals uh, for uh, Im improved automobile engines. Well, that's probably not something that's going to get a venture capitalist excited. And what, one of the reasons is uh, that in an industrial world like that, um, it, it just takes so long to get things designed and get them designed in and get them built in. You're kind of fighting City Hall. Uh, who knows if the Ford Motor Company will ever accept your engine? I mean, it it, it, it introduces a whole different uh, uh, set of issues. I don't know what kind of industrial products we're talking about here, but uh, <coughs> the, the, if you look at what the VCs have done, the, the deals that they've focused in the past have not been heavy industry kind of stuff, at, at least not heavy mechanical industry kinds right. of things. Uh, more, much more toward uh, uh, electronics and soft industry. All right. Um, a question on uh, it. So there's a couple of questions. So I'll combine them into one. One is is uh, how do you choose an advisor? And this, and then a follow on to that is how important to have an advisory board. Uh, you know, I've, I told you at the beginning, I've been around hundreds of companies in the di different capacities. Uh, and at this point, uh, when a company runs into trouble uh, or has some kind of a problem, um, I can usually reach back into my experience and find one or two other companies that have had that problem. You know, so I've kind of been there before and had that problem. Um, and, and for that reason, I think I bring a lot of value to the companies I work with. I, I work with a very small number of companies. I have to be very selective about it. But, but look at the, the math there. See, I, I didn't have that when I had been involved with one company. And I didn't have that when I had been involved with five companies. Uh, I got it after I, I'd sat on 30 boards of directors uh, and dealt indirectly with another 150 investment transactions uh, and looked at hundreds and hundreds of companies and uh, d decided to invest in some and not invest in others. Uh, so that, that's kind of a long way to say... Uh, you want to be careful. Select. You'd like to select advisors who have a lot of experience with startups. Yep. You know, someone who's had one or two successful startup doesn't necessarily know all the ropes. They don't. They don't necessarily have uh, the kind of experience that says, "Well, if we have a problem, they can probably reach back into their bag of tricks uh, and uh, find a find a solution to it." 
Um, so I, I think breadth of experience is uh, just a real important criteria. I mean, it's like when you, if you're going to go have somebody do laser surgery on your eyes, uh, who do you go to? You go out and find a guy who's done 50,000 uh, procedures, right? Uh, you don't go to somebody who, who uh, has done 100. Um, as far as advisory boards are concerned, uh, I think they're great especially like a technology advisory board, maybe a, a market advisory board, um, but uh, some cautions. Uh, people, if, if you're gonna do that, um, pick, the, pick the right people, but organize it and use it. You know, I, I see an awful lot of phantom advisory boards. Uh, just uh, advisory boards that uh, people put together so they'd have a long list of luminary names. You know, I got Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and, and uh, Hewlett and Packard and uh, all these other guys, and I'm supposed to invest because of that. Investors don't invest in advisors. They don't invest in advisory boards. Uh, and the mistake that people make is to get these long lists of advisors uh, and put them out there as an advertisement um, yeah. and not really uh, tap into their brain power, not really organize it, not really compensate them, not really uh, have them meet on a systematic basis. So if you're going to do it, do it real, you know, make it real uh, and take advantage of it. The other thing you have to be careful about with advisory boards is you don't want to create something that comes into conflict with your board of directors. Board of directors runs the company. Uh, you don't want an advisory board that tries to take the company off in different directions than the board of directors. Um, so if, if you are gonna have an advisory board, uh, you, you wanna make sure that you're not creating uh, conflict somehow with your board of directors. You wanna be crystal clear uh, that the, the board of directors has the final say. Uh, Fred, uh, we have a few questions around pitch deck, so I'm going to ask you uh, and then connect it to the other questions. So one is, what makes a good pitch deck? And would investors, VCs, be interested in a, a flashy, a lot of graphics, maybe $10,000 pitch deck, or it's the, the content is more important? Um Pitch decks are, are tricky, and I, I, I'm seeing a, a lot of pitch decks these days that have a lot of graphics, a lot of stuff, uh, and I sometimes they really turn me off. I'll tell you what really turns me off. It's the ones that are, are uh, wh white uh, font on a black background. Because I print all my pitch decks out, I it's print so them out to read. <laughs> and make a file. Well, well, but, but, but then my printer comes back and says, feed me more toner. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I get it. <laughs> they're, they're toner killers. So, so let me ask. I'll try and answer the question. Um, everybody kind of knows the uh, outline for a business plan. You know, the, the, there's probably twelve or fifteen topics that ought to be covered in a business plan. It's uh, you know, what's the concept? Uh, what problems being solved? What's the market? How, how big is the market? Um, Who's the team? What's the competition? I mean, you know those headings. Um, some companies have a tendency to just sort of go through that list of topics and fill in the blanks very quickly, fill in the blanks. So who's the team? Well, the team is Fred, Roger, Tom, Bill, and John. That's not the question. So what you, you really have to, to put together a good pitch deck, you have to step back from a business plan outline and say, what question is being asked? And am I answering the question? So on this one, let's just take this example about the team. The, team, the question is not, who are the people on your team? The question is, who are the people on your team? What have they done in the past? And why are they the best people on the planet to be running this business and making this business successful over the next couple of years? That's the question. I, I'll, we referred earlier to competition. 
and I, I, I said how important it is to get inside competition. The, the competition question is not what are your seven features and how do they compare to the seven features that the other guys have? The question is, what's the dynamics of, of competition in your industry? Who are the other competitors? What makes you think that you can compete against them for the next 10 or 20 years? Why would I say 20 years? <coughs> because if I'm going to take your company public eight years from now, somebody's got to believe that it's got another eight years or 12 years of life in the future or they're not going to buy it on the public offering. So who are the comp competitors in your space? What's the basis for competition? Is it pricing? Is it quality of service? Is it turnaround time, uh, response time? There are a lot of different ways that companies compete. Uh, how are the other guys doing? What makes you think you can do better? What are they going to be doing three years from now? What's their competitive response going to be? Competition isn't static. If you enter a marketplace with a hot new product, the other guys aren't just going to sit there and let you steal the market from them. So what, what's their response? So the question is, it's not who are your competitors? The question is, what is the dynamic of competition in, in your industry? Uh, and what's your strategy? Uh, and why do you believe you have a successful strategy for maintaining a position in that industry? Yeah. Um, okay. So we'll, we'll segue to another question. Thanks. That that was that's really important, Fred. And and not many people truly understand that. So well, let me let me add a footnote there about yeah. uh, about uh, some of these fancy uh, graphics. I'm I'm prompted a lot of. A lot of pitch decks prompt me to say um, a word is worth a thousand pictures. I, I see a lot of cute diagrams and fancy charts and graphs, uh, and I look at them and I don't know what they're telling me. Uh, I can't figure it out on my own. Um, and, you know, if the person isn't there to explain it to me, it just goes right over my head. So I'm much more on the side of uh, give me the substance. <laughs> I'd probably rather see a bunch of bullets. Uh, sometimes a picture or a diagram uh, really does a good job of illustrating what's going on. Yeah. But an awful lot of the time I'm seeing pictures and diagrams that don't really tell me anything. And people, people say, well, yeah, but I'll be there to explain it. But not always. I mean, when you yeah. send me a pitch deck uh, to apply to pitch to Monday Club, you're not standing there explaining those pictures to me. I got to figure it out. And if I can't figure it out, then it just goes right over my head. Also, if I want to send it to my partners or send it to other investors, you're not there to explain it. So I'd lean toward... Uh, getting the substance. That doesn't mean write paragraphs. I don't want a, a written business plan, uh, but you can get an awful lot of messages across with 15 slides, six bullets each. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, tell you the truth, I always tell people that you need to have a, a, a pitch deck that someone can read and get it, and then a pitch deck that you can present. So they're really two different ones. Um, a question from, that's not the one I wanted on the screen, it's scrolled up, and here's the one from Jay Lancey. What do you suggest uh, for entertainment companies that need large sums of funding that take one to three years before a product release? The reason I brought this up on the screen is because uh, you and I always run into companies that they say, I just need money I don't, it's going to take me three years before I have a proof of concept or an MVP and I don't have the money to get there. You know, I guess this is a dilemma. What what should companies like this or startups like this do? Um, I, you know, in, in uh, the past, the venture capital world uh, has really been pretty separate from the world of, say, film finance. Um, there have been some VCs that have done some uh, video game financing, and some of them have made a lot of money doing that. <laughs> but I think it's kind of a sector. You know, it's 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 not 
the broad uh, venture capital industry uh, as a whole, I don't think, uh, goes after that. And, and w one way to think about that uh, is when I was running 3i Ventures, um, w we uh, occasionally would have a deal that we would look at it and we'd say, um, that's a platinum record deal. You know that somebody's going to have a platinum record, but how do you know who it's going to be? Yeah. And how do you figure it out ahead of time? And, and it, it gets into um, how do you make judgments about consumer psychology? You know, how yeah. do you know what consumer products are going to take off? And the VCs have not, I, I want to say they haven't been good at that, but they haven't even tried very hard. I mean, that, it, traditionally, they haven't done a lot of things that involve computer uh, consumer psychology. I mean, how do you know, you know, which restaurant, which movie? Uh, those are really yeah. hard questions to answer. And it's very different than saying, here's a chip and I've got a patent uh, and nobody else can make it. I mean, it's it's a different kind of world. I think those worlds have got blurred a little bit. Uh, you know, the, <laughs> yeah. the video gaming world, the, uh, the world of uh, computer apps. Once in a while, you have uh, uh, something that does uh, uh, reach out to consumers. Uh, and we've had some Acorn deals in that category. So I think the distinction has got blurred some. Um, but... Uh, I, I think when you get right down to it, uh, the venture capital world, anyway, uh, has not been quick to embrace consumer product kind of, of uh, things because you can't do your homework. You can't do any due diligence. You can't yeah. sit down and, and logic your way through and say, well, this one's going to succeed. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a gamble. Uh, all right. So let's see. We have um, uh, may, maybe I can squeeze in a couple of questions here, Fred. One is, well, let, this is kind of related to your book, The Fundable Startup. So if, if, if the listeners have not seen that book or read that book first, is you got to buy the book. Uh, it's the real deal. So um, The Fundable Startup. So what is a fundable CEO and how does a startup find one of those so they become that fundable 1% startup? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, well, um, JJ, I, I, I may steal from my uh, final answer here. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's all right. <laughs> um, the the uh, well, we've already said that uh, part of being a fundable, fundable startup is having a, a compelling idea. Uh, and the other part is uh, having a, a compelling and fundable management team. So there, there are probably three or four ways to do that. <coughs> um, I, if I, I, how's our time? If, if I got time, I'll tell a couple stories. So we got about eight minutes. Well, okay, I'll, I'll, t I'll, I'll build in a couple stories here. Okay. Uh, the the, uh, the the story of the founding of DRC Computer is one of the case studies in the fundable startup, and it it kind of illustrates uh, my point here. Um, the the founder of DR, DRC Computer um, invented a concept. Uh, it, this is uh, in the late 1900s. <laughs> nine, I can't put a date on it, late uh, 1990s, probably something like that, concept of reconfigurable computing. Uh, his idea was a mixture of hardware and software, very creative, that said, look, I think I know how to build a computer uh, that I could, I could reconfigure the underlying architecture of the computer on the fly. Yeah. Well, why would you want to do that? Well, maybe you want to do 100,000 things in parallel for a few minutes and then go back to doing things sequential. Uh, there are a lot of reasons that you might like to do that. Uh, it was a great concept, and uh, he was a very uh, good technical guy. He had no uh, management experience or business background. Uh, and he went out and got a couple grants and got a couple contracts and built up uh, about a 10 or 12-man uh, company uh, and he tried to raise venture capital and he could not raise venture capital. Um, in the late 1990s, I was on his board for a few years. 
Um, and I went through that with him. The VCs uh, were not going to back him as the CEO. Uh, they wouldn't tell him that. Um, but uh, from my venture capital experience, I mean, at that point, I had run a venture capital fund for almost 10 years, top, top tier. I mean, we were syndicating deals with Sequoia and Kleiner and IVP and all the top guys. Uh, so I knew from that experience that uh, he, he just wasn't going to get fu VC funding. When the dot-com bubble burst, um, his company crashed. So I went to him after the dot after that, like 2001, probably, uh, and said, "Look, I, you've got a great idea here. Um, let's bring in an experienced CEO, and and I think we'll be able to go out and raise money." So it took a year or two, but we found a guy who had uh, uh, been the chief operating officer at Tandem Computer up in Silicon Valley. Uh, his name was Larry Lorich, and he was kind of in between things, and he, he was a good guy, and he. He joined us and helped us uh, put together all the pitch decks. And we went out and raised $7 million in venture capital funding and built uh, the strongest, uh, the most powerful gene sequencing computer on the planet. Uh, so uh, you can see the, the difference there. I mean, that, the, what made the difference in that case? I mean, that's a very controlled experiment. What made the difference there was having a CEO who had done it before. Um, that's the right CEO, yeah. In, in my uh, Novadime Therapeutics company, I helped organize the company for four or five years. So I wasn't uh, officially a CEO and I wasn't planning to be the CEO, but I acted as uh, an interim CEO. Uh, and uh, uh, we went out and got an $18 million commitment from Domain Associates. Uh, venture capital company and part of the deal was once we have some money in the bank we'll go to the recruiters and find uh, a top level CEO from the uh, the vaccine business so another and th these are all written up in the fundable startup but uh, so that's two approaches one is get the CEO two is uh, get a, sort of an interim CEO Three is, uh, and here my case study is Lori Torres, who did such a great job of building up a parcel pending and uh, and uh, selling it last year for over a hundred million bucks. But I interviewed her five or six years ago, and she's in the book. I mean, that interview was probably dated 20, uh, 2015, maybe something like that. And I wrote her up as someone who didn't have CEO experience, but probably had a pretty good chance of succeeding because she had a lot of good, strong management experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. So sometimes you can take your management experience, maybe you were an engineering manager in a large organization or something like that. Uh, but sometimes uh, you can um, take that kind of experience and convince investors that it will translate you know that that you've had enough of that you know how to hire and fire people you know how to build a team you, you know how to uh, plan you know how to uh, man manage the finances um, so uh, and I I do see uh, sometimes companies that uh, are CEOs that undersell themselves that way you know they have that experience but they don't put it on you know they, they answer, who's your team? Well, Bill, Bob, John, and Fred. Uh, and they don't say, uh, Bill's never been a CEO before, but he ran this engineering organization for 13 years. And Which, I mean, no one's born as a CEO. So, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, some, <laughs> I guess the point is, if you've got some good management experience, um, you know, don't don't be bashful. Uh, uh, feature it. Go out and talk about it. And then the other thing you can do, we've talked about, it, is bootstrap. Yep. You know, ju just get started, get a product, get a customer, uh, demonstrate what you can do, uh, and uh, um, go make it happen. And and then hopefully through that process, you've uh, convinced investors th that you can make it happen. Yeah. All right, Fred. So. We're, we're only like a couple of minutes away. So I'm going to ask you to, I'm going to do some closing and I'm going to ask you to maybe come up with one recommendation for, uh, I know you said a lot of things, but maybe something that would be the top of the list that would 
uh, be beneficial to the uh, to the investors. I mean, to the listeners. I'm sorry. So, um, so while while you're thinking about that, I am going to do some closing. So first, to the listeners, if you have not subscribed to our uh, YouTube channel, please do that right now. Just click on it and and uh, please subscribe. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media. Uh, you know all the normal stuff: the LinkedIn, the Twitter, etc. Um, if we have a um, we have a lineup of some a, a great lineup coming up. Uh, so we have uh, on on Thursday this week, July second, we have a case study. It's an IP case study by uh, Buck Alter uh, Law Firm. Uh, next week we have Scott Hamilton. The week after that, Steve Mednick. Uh, the week after that, Bruce Verga, who's I saw him on uh, listening today. Um, so we have a great lineup and we might have an announcement of something that you guys may be interested in next week so stay tuned um fred that one recommendation one advice what would that be well it's, here's here's a different way of kind of pulling together uh my messages um startups need to realize that when they go out to raise capital they're competing with other startups for that capital. You know, if you want to be one of the 1% uh, that get funded, uh, then you got to beat out the other 99. Yep. Uh, and uh, that really uh, dictates some things about how you present yourself, how you think about the whole process. What that means is that that VC who's sitting there with 50 business plans on his desk is comparing your compelling idea to their compelling idea, so it better be better, uh, and he's comparing your fundable management team to their fundable management team. Yep. So you got to beat those guys out. If you think about it that way as, as having to compete against companies that have or may have uh, management teams that have done it before, how do you comp how do you do that? You know that that's the game you're playing, and you got to have a winning strategy. You you can't just go out and say, "Hey, we got a great idea, and everybody's going to love it," uh, which is kind of the approach that a lot of startups take. You really have to compete for capital, and you got to have a strategy uh, for showing why your idea is better and your management team is better. Fred, thank you so much for being here today. I think. Uh, from all the comments and the emails I've been receiving, uh, it's been very, very valuable. Your wisdom has been awesome. We appreciate you being here with us today. Thanks, JJ. It's been fun. Talk soon. Thanks, everyone. And uh, subscribe and come back next week and uh, for the many weeks to come because we have a great lineup uh, for the next at least two months. So talk soon.